uh, certainly a pleasure to be here and be part of this industry even in a, in a small way. What I want to talk about today is uh, the uh, solar cell technology that my company is developing that uh, is found by the attraction right now with the uh, hand launch UAPs that are used by uh, DOD. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go through that in, in some detail. Um, first, uh, you know, just a, a bit of background about myself, long history of uh, being associated with, uh, with aviation. Um, my father was a uh, crop tester for a lot of years and built a good special cycle uh, from scratch. So I saw a lot of uh, uh, aviation up close. And then uh, uh, a brother who uh, flew F-16s for a long time, and I built um, uh, thousands of model airplanes, I think, and crashed almost all of them uh, at my RC uh, adventures. And then I've also Quite a bit of exposure. Um, this, um, the, the company that, that I run and, and started, uh, it's called Alta Devices, and it um, did start off as having um, a lot of bearing on, on aviation or on um, air vehicles. Um, what we were um, uh, focused on is competing in, in some of the mainstream um, uh, solar markets. And so we started uh, as, uh, as kind of a traditional um, Silicon Valley startup company. Um, we had a couple of professors, Dr. Gowdwater, who's head of the Applied Physics Laboratory at Caltech, and Eli Ogunovich, who's a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, nominated for a Nobel Prize last year, that uh, had some cool ideas about how to um, marry the uh, power generation from solar cells that's used in the space program with uh, terrestrial applications. And so uh, our, our technology uh, uh, comes from uh, you know, the Russian and, and U.S. Uh, space programs for solar power. Basically, we use uh, gallium arsenide uh, solar cells that have the advantage of being um, very, very high performance. So they can uh, adapt and be designed to adapt to a very uh, broad uh, a range of uh, spectral inputs and convert that, that energy to, um, uh, to electricity. So there, it turns out to be a fabulous material for that. The problem with it is it's really expensive and so uh, difficult to, to use it um, in uh, uh, for terrestrial applications. So when we started the company, uh, we um, uh, were financed by uh, Klein Perkins and August Capital, two of the big venture firms in Silicon Valley, and we were focused on on taking this technology and building super thin cells out of solar cells out of out of uh, gallium arsenide. And uh, the idea was that you could design the cell in a way that you get all the performance that the uh, solar cells that are used in outer space have, but use such small amounts of material that it would be cost effective um, uh, here on here on, uh, on, uh, on Earth. And so we uh, were targeting uh, competing head on in the um, uh, traditional uh, solar markets for flat panel, and then also we had a big program for doing building integrated, and uh, we're working with several customers who still so are. Uh, GE, uh, chemical, et cetera, for doing um, roofing products where the solar cells are integrated into the, um, into the roof itself. Uh, two or three years ago, when we started to observe that the uh, solar market was headed into a really, really tough time for the for mainstream solar because of the Chinese domination of the industry and the uh, uh, declining prices, uh, it became very hard to compete for, to, for new technology to compete in that space. So we did kind of classic Silicon Valley pivot, and we began to look uh, to, uh, to, to how we had thought about the technology to start with, and, and also this, this practice that, that we do quite often in, in our kind of company, where you just assume that everything you know today is probably not true, and if the opposite is actually the case, what are you going to do to survive? And so that caused us to turn back to our NASA roots and look to how power um, uh, was used, or how gallium arsenide solar cells were used to generate power um, originally. And, and we started to draw some connections. And um, uh, one was with how, uh, how phones had transitioned from being uh, tethered to the wall to, um, uh, to being completely untethered from, a, uh, from the, the data and pure communications point of view. And we began to wonder if there was an opportunity to further untether devices like phones from uh, from the wall, from a, uh, a power point of view. And, and you know, we recognize that satellites are, are pretty um, pretty autonomous from the power point of view. You do not get to plug them in um, you know, by and large ever again once they're once they're launched. And so they better be able to generate all their own power. So we um, um, so we began looking at these markets and, and we have over the last three years um, found a, a lot of opportunity to to take our type of technology into to what we call the mobile power 
space, right? They're basically providing energy for anything that, that moves or can be carried or, or can be worn. And so it, it turns out that to, to, to do that successfully, I mean, you need a couple of things. One is you need a cell that's very flexible, thin, and light, and can be incorporated into the products that need power. So our, our source cells look like this. They look like just pieces of plastic. And, uh, so they're, uh, they're, they're very thin. The active material is one micron thick. So you're, a human hair is 40 microns thick. One of these cells is one micron. So it's just a tiny, tiny amount of material. But uh, uh, it happens to have the highest performance of any solar cell that's, that's ever been built. Um, we, uh, we hold the world records for, for several of these types. One at almost 29%, the other at almost 31% efficient, conversion efficiency. A uh, typical silicon solar cell converts 15 or 16%. And a typical flexible solar cell is somewhere between four and ten or twelve percent. So, uh, so the amount of energy that you can get from this type of solar cell is much much higher than any other type of material. So we, um, uh, so we have, so we we we've got this material that has this very high energy density, it's flexible, it's thin, and um, we began uh, looking for markets where we could incorporate it, where we could solve a power generation problem that had enough value that you could monetize the value and create a business model that would allow a, a startup company with a, a new technology to find its way into the market in a, in a slower and more organized fashion than kind of rush into big scale solar. So we identified um, a couple of markets early on. We happened to have a guy in our company that was a, a Navy SEAL uh, before getting his MBA and uh, he knew a bunch of folks at SOCOM and he introduced his to. So we, uh, uh, we began a discussion there. That led us to um, Air Environment, uh, which uh, opened our eyes up to uh, uh, a whole range of um, airborne opportunities, which then turned into an introduction to the rapid equipping force of the Army, which was, you know, then um, uh, led us to the Marines. And, uh, so we've, we've now got a lot of touch points into, into DOD that are all focused on, on uh, various forms of mobile, mobile power. Um, after, after you know, starting to get our feet on there, in that in that market, uh, we, we um, uh, were able to find opportunities in consumer electronics that, that some are obvious, uh, iPad chargers, iPhone chargers, or phone chargers, and that sort of thing. Others are like less um, obvious in terms of uh, powering uh, uh, industrial sensors or um, remote uh, sensing of, of different forms of uh, pipelines and that sort of thing that need small amounts of solar, very high um, energy uh, density, and often need to be hidden. Um, the the, the, the uh, environment or people around it can't, can't be aware that there's something generating power because the sensor itself is often um, uh, hidden. And then uh, we've also uh, discovered that there's a bunch of opportunity in transportation on I mean, everything that you can imagine from putting solar on top of a, uh, a heavy equipment tractors to keep the air conditioning running when the, uh, uh, with the diesel um, engine not running. And so it's just the cost of diesel becomes so high in some of these, in these mining applications, construction applications, that being able to run the electrical subsystems without having to, uh, to run the, um, the fuel, uh, the primary fuel power plant is, um, is an advantage. And so, um, so, so in, in the intervening um, uh, several years, we've uh, started to, to build products in each of these spaces. So for, uh, for the Army, between 10 and several hundred watts each. And the uh, whole idea is basically to be able to fold up into a small area and very lightweight um, pack um, a bunch of energy that, uh, energy generation capability that helps um, the soldier carry a lot less batteries um, and enables them to um, power their electronics and also gives them some autonomy from the, um, uh, from the fossil fuel supply chain. So uh, it turns out that it's a, um, uh, it's a theme that is running um, throughout, uh, throughout most of the DOD and not, and, and not just the U.S. military either. It's kind of this, this worldwide trend where a typical soldier is carrying 25 to 30 pounds of batteries. It's just an enormous amount of, of, uh, of uh, battery load. And, and, and it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive. That the, uh, the military has no real interest in lightening the load for the soldier. You hear that a lot, but when you push into it, that's not their role at all. What they want them to carry is stuff other than batteries. So they're trying to get the battery weight out of the pack so they can cram more useful mission critical um, equipment into the pack. And so, so it has a big motivation and, and not just in the US. And so 
uh, uh, so we've, we've been through most of our business right now, in fact, is, is servicing this type of, of opportunity. And it's, it's kind of a nifty one because they can pay a lot of money and we can, we can make money off of a, a sub-scale by source where there's manufacturing lines that exist here in the United States and uh, help us uh, learn about how to manufacture the technology, improve the yields, and, and, and get down the, uh, the learning and cost curves. Um, and then we also have uh, uh, a handful of projects going on in, in pure consumer electronics. This is sort of quite cost sensitive, but um, uh, well, for example, we have an iPad charger that has enough solar on the cover, it's the footprint of the, the, the iPad, that it generates the same amount of power as what you get when plugging it into the wall. So if you're in full sun, even for, for 15 minutes, you can get a, a, a useful amount of charge. The other thing that's unique about our material is it happens to um, do very well in the so the, uh, the efficiency or conversion rate of, of gallium arsenic material um, indoors is, is quite high, and uh, uh, in fact it's higher than, than the spectral response that you get out of The overall intensity of the light is much less, so you're generating less energy, but if you're comparing it to other solar solutions, it's, it's easily five times better. So in most cases, you can think about solar on consumer electronics as being a um, uh, kind of like an adder uh, to, your, to your battery life. Think of it as adding 15 to 20 percent to the battery life of anything you have. It's just constantly harvesting um, energy from um, you know, CFLs or uh, ambient light, etc. So, um, uh, so the whole whole range of applications there, and those those also drive into things that you know. There's just a long list that you would you would not guess if you start start talking to people time after time. But um, uh, you know, the Dr. Green has a great project to put. Um, um, solar strips along, along those. Um, it's it's uh, um, watches, uh, um, blinds that you know for your windows and power that they don't want to have to worry about wires. Just all these things that you just start thinking about everything that has a battery in it, where you never want to change the battery. In fact, money to get rid of the battery. There's there's an opportunity for um, for a material that you can incorporate into the object itself or the product itself, and it generates um, enough energy that you can really come up something meaningful with it. So. So it's an area that continues to grow. On the, on the um, transportation side, the, uh, there's a couple of, um, of dynamics that, that make um, uh, this type of material useful. One is even in combustion engines, uh, by incorporating two or 300 watts on the rooftop of the vehicle, you can increase the fuel economy by somewhere between 3 and 6%. And it's all done by offloading the heavy load components. And so it turns out that your fuel consumption in an automobile is very nonlinear. Um, it's extraordinarily poor when you accelerate, so that's why hybrids work. It's extraordinarily poor when the air conditioning is running. And if you can just offload a few things like that with, um, with some extra electricity, you can get a bump in the fuel economy. And so the cafe standards keep ratcheting up. Um, and uh, when automobile manufacturers are looking at redesigning the drivetrain, um, these, these small percentages of fuel economy start to be, start to be pretty, um, a pretty big advantage. And, and a lot of it is sort of um, um, you know, virtuous in that if you go from move from a, a, a you know, mechanical air conditioner to an electrical air conditioner, it's lighter and more efficient, um, as well as improving your fuel economy. And then on top of that, the CAFE standards, which are the, the government regulations that, that determine what fuel economy performance you have to have as an automobile manufacturer, they also give you credit for having solar or hybrid technology in a car. And so, uh, automobile manufacturers need some of those credits in order to ensure that their fleet will meet the, uh, the overall standards, which, which are headed towards about 54 miles per gallon uh, fleet-wide. So it's, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, these are big, big numbers. Um, so we've uh, had, uh, had uh, quite a bit of traction there with projects like Nissan and Toyota and GM and Ford. And then the one that, that you probably really care about, which is the, um, the unmanned air vehicle. So we, we started uh, with, um, uh, two or three uh, small projects uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago now. Um, we started with our, with our work with SOCOM um, in taking uh, some uh, electric um, uh, hand launched uh, UAVs and incorporating some solar into the wing. And uh, that eventually turned into a project where we, um, uh, we were able to build sheets of this, of this film that uh, could be incorporated directly into the skin of the wing itself as part of the manufacturing of the wing. So there's no extra lamination required. In fact, we use the same epoxy that's used to finish the, uh, 
um, the uh, wing um, for the final uh, the final layer. So you end up with literally just this, this very thin material to work with in the structure. So it adds, adds only a, a tiny amount of weight. And our initial test, we were able to demonstrate flight times of um, that were sub one hour purely battery powered to um, to about four hours. And through um, uh, some subsequent work where we were able to start designing these things in sheets that could be different sizes and you could fit to the, um, the, the structure of the, and the form of the wing and so they could cover um, most of the surface and in fact they can often cover the bottom surface as well and it done much time because so it reflected light very effectively and so you did quite a uh, quite a boost in performance and we've been able to demonstrate on platforms that are widely deployed in DOT um, uh, as much as, uh, well essentially it's the same flight all day long. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, quite a few examples now where planes go up in the morning at, at first light and they uh, come down after dusk when the battery has um, been fully depleted but it's essentially running on solar power all day long. These are just the platforms that are used for surveillance and, and communications. And so, um, so we're pretty big believers in, in this space. The, uh, uh, it, it's a great market, that this market in particular, we, you know, have, this happens from the mission profile point of view, this ability to fly all day for some of these type of, uh, of operations, especially in the, um, um, the deal with the special operations, special forces, uh, is, is a big deal. The um, uh, damage rate of retrieval of human uh, beings is high, and so they have to carry a lot of spares. The, um, uh, the amount of batteries that can be charged capability is extensive, and so uh, it's quite, quite transformational from a, a, a mission point of view to be able to put you maybe uh, have it stay on station and provide the appropriate comms or surveillance that's needed. So the, that same capability, I think, is, is also very useful in, in civil and, um, and pure commercial communities, especially agriculture. Uh, the difficulty is doing it cost effectively. Um, the beautiful thing about uh, the is they can pay a lot of money, and so we can um, uh, we can operate some scale. It's not true for a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the aircraft that, that the folks in this room are involved in, in uh, uh, developing and deploying. So we have some complicated slide, um, but what we've done is, is what we structure our go to market in a way that will allow us to achieve um, price points that can allow you to incorporate uh, solar cells into into a really broad range of of very cost competitive uh, UAVs. And so the way we do that is we start by focusing on, on our military, on military opportunities that give us a lot of learning and uh, understanding about how to manufacture the, the films and how to uh, uh, create products that are uh, amenable to, uh, uh, to, to civilian and commercial cost points or price points. Um, and then, as we get that learning under us, um, we move into um, transportation and consumer uh, opportunities as we get scaled. So the, the challenge in a, in a Technology like ours is being able to go from uh, lab to sort of pilot scale to early manufacturing to scale manufacturing. And it takes a lot of money and a lot of time, and, and there's quite a bit of risk associated with it. And so, the way we approach it is in this, this very incremental fashion that allows us to transition from sort of markets that can pay um, a lot for the, for the uh, product and allow us to get early learning, and then we transition to markets that are increasingly more, um, more cost competitive. And so, um, so ultimately, it would be that this type of material has the capability of, of uh, costing about a dollar a lot, and so uh, it can be, can be quite cost effective. And the way we build it, it comes in sheets that are completely interconnected, and those sheets can be whatever size the, the customer wants. And so, so in the um, uh, projects that we have, we basically work with the, uh, the, the aircraft vendor, figure out exactly how much power they need, how it's going to be integrated electronically, what are the surfaces that are going to be to be covered with film, and then we design sheets that are fully interconnected, have the proper current voltage characteristics to dial protection, and that's what we ship. And then it can be incorporated directly into the, the, the appropriate surfaces during the manufacturing of the aircraft. And so it's quite um, low overhead. Uh, typically, um, takes us a, um, a week or two to go from first contact to a flying aircraft, and, uh, and as, as a prototype scale. So. It's not a, not a complicated thing to do, especially if you uh, are, are basically integrated into an existing electronic platform. So our approach, just um, uh, kind of quickly, is the way we build this kind of thing is we start with um, a gallium arsenide wafer, and uh, it's, a, it's a standard semiconductor wafer that is uh, four inches square. It's exactly the size of, of, of this film. And 
we, uh, we wrote a thin layer on top of it that is called um, aluminum arsenic. And so what happens with, with, yeah, with this kind of a semiconductor material is you can grow different crystals on top of it that have exactly the same crystal and structure. So most of the time, if you have a crystal of one type and you try to put another type on top, they have different lattice constants and they, they don't fit. You get strain and defects and it just doesn't work. This John Marstein is unique because it doesn't do that. There are materials that you can incorporate directly into the same lattice. That's why it's important for the space program because you can build very high efficiency devices by essentially incorporating multiple solar cells into the same crystal structure. So we take advantage of that by growing this very thin level of Marstein and then we grow our one micron solar cell on top of it. And then we, um, we put down the back metal so it's fully, fully connected on, on the back at that step. And then we um, put a plastic on it. So the same plastic that's on it now is what happens in the manufacturing process. Then it just goes into a, uh, uh, a wet etch step that etches away that yellow layer of aluminum arsenic and it separates the solar cell from the underlying wafer. So the trick we do to keep the cost down is we no longer have to have a gallon, a gallon arsenic wafer that gets consumed in the process. So in the space program, that whole wafer ends up having to uh, uh, get launched. And a bunch of fuel has to be put into a rocket to launch that entire heavy wafer into space, and you have to pay for that. Um, and we get around it by, by having the process to get the film off the wafer without harming the wafer, without actually using the wafer, we're just growing on top of it. These things cost a couple hundred bucks, the wafers do, so it's, uh, it's an important uh, uh, work technology. Um, and then the wafer is, is reused and you know, we put the uh, front metal on and uh, cut it up into small pieces and then those pieces can be connected into sheets and those sheets can be any size. And so this, this is one that has to be incorporated with any material but um, they can be anything up to a meter and a half a side and, and like I said we do whatever size fits on the meeting for the you and me guys. Um, and so then the uh, uh, big performance advantage of this type of material is like the space program we can incorporate more complex structures into our, into our devices. And so, we're currently at 29% for our simplest devices. We have a 31% device for um, uh, our, our sort of second generation. It's on its way to 33%. And ultimately, um, you can, can see a path to sort of 38, 40% conversion efficiency. So you're literally talking about three to five times more energy than you can get from a uh, uh, solar solar cell. And, and, and this material, unlike silicon, works great in off angles, works great in diffuse light. So if you uh, are not directly facing the sun because of a flight angle, um, it, you don't see um, dramatic drops in the power output. So it's, it's one of these very stable types of material. It's a great application for a great technology for this type of application. So today we have about um, 50 people. We have a pilot line that's capable of building about a million watts a year, a megawatt per year of capacity. It's located at Sunnyvale, California, just uh, 50 miles off of here. And uh, a bunch of patents, um, a little over 80 now that that uh, uh, protect the technology. Again, um, over the next couple of years, um, we expect to ship um, about $35 million in revenue um, between 2013 and 2014, most of it into uh, uh, DOD and agency tech projects, both for um, uh, ground mount uh, power generation and air power generation. So thank you very much. Uh, I can probably answer your questions for a few minutes ago. Yes, sir. Uh, so, we've got the bulging trade secrets or military secrets. Uh, could you talk about the profile, the UAV example that you gave in terms of an all day flight profile? What size of aircraft are you talking about? What kinds of weights, power consumption, just a general profile of what that, what that aircraft looks like and how you were able to acknowledge such a natural flight? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, it it's basically a two-meter wingspan, very well-known um, uh, manufacturer, about a 20-pound aircraft, used primarily for surveillance and communications. Um, it was a standard, standard configuration um, mixed with the addition of the solar on, on one side of the balloon surface. So I had 130 watts of, of solar um, incorporated into the other surface of the wings. And it was a, um, uh, clearly, we've done, it between, we've done those kind of tests between November and um, and, and July, those, those kind of things we have a lot of data on, and it's, it's flown well in all of them. Um, obviously, better in the summer than, than, um, than in the winter, but, but it's flown well in all. And, and the electronics configuration is unchanged. The original battery is left in. And all the, all, you know, basically, the design uses the solar to recharge the battery real time. This is a problem. So, then you see yourself being able to. Um, uh, so the question is, is, 
is the products of independent being incorporated into transparent applications. And, and the problem with that is that, so the answer is um, uh, no, not really. And, and you know, the way SolarWorks is, if it's not black, then you're reflecting a bunch of the light, and um, uh, which means you're not getting the best conversion efficiency out of it. So there are technologies where people do that because it's, it's useful for, for, for Windows, and, and uh, there can be large service areas that that's an attractive thing to do. Um, this type of technology doesn't really lend itself to that, and our focus is on these very high energy density um, uh, applications, which, which, which means you want to capture every bit of light. You just don't want anything to go through, you don't want anything back out. Yes, Are you developing any programs for architectural structures, size of buildings, panels, stuff like that, architectural features? Um, we have a couple of projects going on. We're pretty far out because the cost um, demands are, are pretty, um, uh, pretty straight. I mean, you need to be quite low cost for those, those applications. And so you have to be at quite, quite a larger scale than, than we're at. So, so we do have a couple of projects going on, mostly in Japan. Um, and so I think that there's there's opportunity there, but it's it's, it's a really competitive uh, uh, competitive market. And then there's another uh, concept in the solar world that's called bankability, which is this concept of having enough history in the field that uh, of solar panels or, or whatever form is employed really operating that you know they're going to work for years and years. And so typically, a solar power plant is rated for 25 years, and they're all different than including sides of buildings and even the residential rooftops. I mean, they're all financed, and the banks that finance them want to know that the material um, isn't likely to fail mid mid-life. And so um, it takes a long time for a technology like ours to accumulate that track record. And so it's also difficult to get into into large buildings because it's an even bigger problem to have to replace it than it is not in the field. So uh, uh, I think it's a big opportunity. It's five to ten years away. Could you, uh, uh, in the layman's language, give us a sense of cost? I know you've been talking a lot about the fact that the technology is quite expensive. Uh, in relationship to other technologies, um, what are we talking about? So just to get a, a sense of uh, scale or you know, multiples of Yeah, yeah, it, it's, all, it's all comparison for, for you guys. I mean, it's kind of expensive for us as um, um, these differences matter. So if you go you by silicon, um, solar module, You'll pay about seventy cents a watt right now. Seven zero cents per watt in a, in a you know for rigid rectangular module. That, that that's pretty uh, pretty common. The um, uh, our our cost right now is in our pilot line is around ten dollars a watt. So it's, when you compare it to that part, it's a, it's a lot more expensive. Um, if you compare it to what the space program pays, they pay between three hundred and a thousand dollars a watt. So uh, so it's all relative. But a ten dollars a watt way too high to get into any kind of traditional utility scale, but it's great for the military to plot that on. Um, for, for 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 civil UAVs and, and consumer electronics, um, you need to be able to sell that for a few bucks a lot. Two to three dollars a lot. So what we think that there's a, there's a big opportunity to come to the market to become quite elastic in that, in that price range. There's opportunities on either side of it, uh, that price point. But, but so so that's what we, we you know, where we're gonna drive to is getting our cost structure. To the point where we can service markets at the two to three dollars a lot. Yes. Um, what are the prospects of being able to move beyond your reliance on gallium arsenide? Because that's uh, I suspect as a limiting factor in terms of cost and scale uh, into you know, possibly even silver or, or other materials. Um, yeah, we don't plan to. Um, we plan to stick with gallium arsenide. It turns out that. Uh, uh, you can get a cheaper solar cell using gallium arsenide than you can with silicon at um, scale. And, and the reason is that you generate so much more energy from gallium arsenide that you amortize out a lot of the costs that are the same. <laughs> Regardless of whose solar cell we're talking about, you still have metal um, that uh, is used to connect the solar cells. Um, you have uh, all the usual electronics that surround the integration of the solar cells. And those are often just fixed, fixed costs. And so if you can generate more energy from those fixed costs, then your cost per watt goes down. And so gallium arsenide has, has much higher energy density than silicon. So typically, you can put our solar cell head to head with, with any other silicon solar cell, and you'll get two to three times the amount of energy generated over the course of a year. So it's, it's a big difference. And so, uh, uh, so, so we're big believers that sticking with gallium arsenide is the right thing to do, but you just have to get to scale. And, 
And, and the kind of scale we're talking about is it requires hundreds of millions of dollars of factory deployment. So it's not, you know, it's, it, it takes time to raise that kind of money and to deploy it wisely and to you know, get the yield under right, control and all, all that kind of stuff. The other great thing about Young Marsman is that it you can incorporate, it's called multi-junction, but you can incorporate, you know, secondary and tertiary and quaternary and cetera, sorts of um, on top of one another, all integrated in the same crystal structure. So it's still one device, but in fact there are different PN junctions in the in the solar cell that are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. And so you can tune your solar cells then to uh, work at, uh, in, in different ways at, at different altitudes or in different parts of the world. Um, and, and over time, you can make them just more efficient by being better at collecting very specific wavelengths of light. Um, which is why they made the space program use because there's no atmosphere filtering the, the light typically, and so they have a very broad spectral input that they, um, they can capture. So, uh, so we like the other Mars for that reason, and then it's great with diffuse light and it's great with concentration. So you, you can start playing in some of these other markets that aren't in, in normally direct sunlight. Um, we expect in 2015 we're starting to work on a battery right now that has will achieve those economics and should be ran in 2015. Is that based on uh, like an inventory objective that you've got so